reproductive rights are under assault in the United States. And what's worse, the rationale put forth by the Supreme Court to justify rolling back nearly 50 years of precedent, that there's no implicit right to privacy in the Constitution, lays the groundwork for a full court press on a host of other settled cases. Deep Listens is taking action and we need your help. Of course we want you to learn about the elected officials in your area and vote in every single election, but we'd like you to consider contributing to the National Network of Abortion Funds as well. The NNAB is a clearinghouse of regional abortion and reproductive health organizations across the United States. Their goal is to remove financial and logistical barriers to abortion access, centering on those looking for assistance and organizing at the intersection of racial, economic, and reproductive justice. You can contribute to the NNAB directly at abortionfunds.org donate. You can also use their site to locate an abortion fund in your area so you can keep your money local and aid your neighbors. Thank you, and now back to your regularly scheduled podcast. Hello, good people. Welcome to Off the Deep End, a Deep Listens podcast where we explore role-playing video games in depth. That's where the name comes from. My name is Jeff Rood, the host and the Adlai Stevenson of this operation. Uh, <laughs> joining me, uh, the regulars here, we have the DeWitt Clinton of this uh, organization. It's mm-hmm. Braden, Arbitrary Water Redacted. Hello, Braden. Hi, Hello. Um, also joining us, the Barry Goldwater of the show. It's Chris, Zombie Pirate Acted. Trickle down economics. Let's nuke them to the Stone Age. Barry Goldwater, underrated American politician, right off the bat, by the way. He, he had a really poor presidential campaign, but overall, in terms of Republicans, I want to like shout out Wayne Morris, Barry Goldwater, I guess Lincoln, you know, like Gold, Goldwater was okay. Just sounded kind of crazy exactly when he shouldn't have. Also, also joining us, in addition to the regular Deep End boys, uh, the John P. Hale of the show. It's Gino, that pinguino, Grieco. Hello, Gino. Hello. I don't know if that person is good or bad. I choose to believe it's good. Well, the, the binding theme of all four of these names, if you're not from the United States or a student of American history, is they are all also rands. They are losing presidential candidates uh, throughout history. And um, speaking of perennial also rands, uh, on this episode, we're going to be talking about The Legend of Dragoon, the, the, the hot game for the PlayStation 1. to do the full rundown the legend of dragoon as you know it was developed by japan studio an organization we will talk about and it was published by sony computer entertainment in-house for the playstation one originally released on december 2nd 1999 in japan and it was subsequently released in the united states and the european union and other territories and uh, eventually it did trickle out onto psn where I guess it's not worth spending a lot of time on this point, but purportedly, like, a bunch of web sources are quick to point out that it was, like, a top five seller of, like, the entire PS1 Classics line for years. Like, people bought the digital reissue of this game, like, it moved units, which is, uh, seems kind of weird. But we, we, we will talk about all these points and more if you would like to be a part of talking about all these points and more before these shows even get recorded. You can do that. It is possible. The universe will let you. You must simply pony up one American dollar. That is one American dollar. But how, Jeff? Where? Where do we send the money? That money gets sent to patreon.com slash deeplistens. Again, if you missed that, that is patreon.com slash deeplistens. Or you can send me a check to zpsporedfun at gmail.com. Yeah, you could just Remember to give your free Amazon Prime subs to twitch.tv slash I need you to go to Walmart water. and I need you to get me five Amazon gift cards or Apple Play cards or Google Play cards. Uh, yeah. We will lead you through the process on your phone 
fellow 60 plus year old person yeah go to my link tree and my amazon wish list is right there and you can also sign up for other services that i offer as mentioned any dollar amount starting at one dollar let me tell you about how cool two dollars is though it's a pretty cool number two is you know, two is, a two you know is like cool a million dollars you know yeah. what's cooler a billion dollars a billion would be very cool we could do let me tell you what the amount of weird content we would make as a group with a billion dollars i bet you'd like to see that i bet you and oh, your yeah. friends would like to see that you know jeff bezos yeah mr if b you're listening or or you're on if you're listening go fuck yourself um but jeff <laughs> bezos um, if you're listening yeah off the deep end is willing to become the official <laughs> game podcast of amazon <laughs> it's no worse than any of the other gaming decisions Amazon has made in the last couple of years. Yeah, we would be willing to work with Jade Raymond for a few weeks uh, before summarily firing them, I think. Uh, that dollar, or that billion, really any denomination, uh, would get you also access to a Discord wherein we hack out these shows a little bit beforehand. And there's ongoing conversations there around all and sundry. We got a Pet Picks channel now. People post in Pet Picks checking my pop filter with that one um it's it's a it's a fun place we're we're, we're nice people so good times Dude, and i guess talking about fighting games recently because evo is happening yeah there's been a little i guess does anyone want to spend a little time chatting about evo before we dive into this game because it I seems like y'all talking fighting about. games are cool yeah i wish i had the time and or patience to get good at them what's on the uh evo docket this year um so... Grand Blue Fantasy has happened already. Uh, Dragon Ball Z, Fighter Z, that is happening. Street Fighter Five, Tekken Seven, Tekken Seven, KOF Fifteen, Skullgirls, finally a main stage game. Yeah, it was multiverse. It only took ten years. <laughs> it's... But Skullgirls is a main stage game for the five people out there who really like Skullgirls. It is hilarious uh... that multiverse is getting promoted and smash is probably not i understand oh, why yes i ain't naive about... one of these companies paid for yeah. the game to be on the stage and the other company actively hates everyone who tries to put on fighting game yeah, the, tournaments also uh hey you worth, know yeah worth noting sony also owns the entire evo apparatus too yes. at this point I... So I, I don't blame them for uh, banishing the Smash fans back to the Dark Warrens underneath a pile of CRT televisions in, from which they dwell. Yeah. Yes. Or, uh, you know, the uh, the court hearings. Anyway. Yeah. Yes. There, uh, yes, exactly. Some, Melty some... Blood type Lumina. Um, I learned something, gentlemen, that uh, watching Evo that I feel you should know. Uh, Hugh Neutron is now in the Nickelodeon Super Smash Brothers clone. Yes. And he apparently has Chun Li's uh, super from Third Strike. Uh, that's okay. I love this. It's 360 plus taunt. <laughs> Makes him do her he super. Does, he does the oh Evo moment God. 37. Yes. Three, a 360 on the, on the joystick plus taunt does that's this. Great. This is buck wild. And I believe the game has a parry. Also, they just announced Mark of the Wolves 2, which I would what? be more excited yeah, about. Yeah, they announced Mark of the Wolves 2. Wait, that sequel. Uh, I would be more excited about if SNK wasn't literally owned yeah. wholly by a murderous dictator. Yeah, coming yeah. Come straight out of Neom, it's Garo, Mark the of the Wolves 2. The city of the too. future, Garo, yeah. Mark of the Wolves. I, I'm going to be honest with you, just hot take. I think fighting... The fighting game genre is one of my least favorite genres just because I find fighting games in general to be just completely inscrutable and inaccessible to me as a okay. person. Adventure and game man. I don't, I don't like them. How many? That's fair. Is, is doing a three-hit combo easier or harder than Nine Men's Morris? Uh, <laughs> easier. <sighs> but yeah, the Evo's going on. Check it out. We're, we're discussing it on the Discord occasionally and, you know... I like story fighting modes cool. in fighting games. Um, the crazier, the better. I think that's why I have a, a soft spot for Blaz Blue because its story fucking went places. I've been playing through like um, Tekken Three again a little bit, just screwing around with it. And I've said this before. I have always felt like I don't know what it is. I think I know that people will always like say that the opposite is true, but I've always found Tekken Tag to be more accessible and more pleasurable as a playing experience than. OG Tekken or the mainline series. 
Yeah, it's the cut and loose one for sure. But like, that's just it. My partner, my spouse has come in and seen me playing freaking Tekken 3 and could kind of give a shit about the Tekken part of it. Like she likes to play Tekken, but she's kind of a masher, which is fine. Uh, but all the like ending cinematic, like the story parts of those games were like, you know, things she experienced as a child with a PlayStation. So she has baked in nostalgia for like the Michelle cut scene at the end of Tekken 2 and stuff. Like there, I, it, it's not lost on me that Giant Bomb is like actively making content around all those little like Tekken cut scenes, basically, because they're kind of incredible. They're amazing. Yeah, the, the content is good too. I I bought Tekken Four as part of my bad PS2 purchases. Yeah. Um, Way to go! That's the one people don't like. Oh yes, the one Tekken people don't like. I mean, it kind of yeah. is. It kind of is. <laughs> like, you know. Yeah, they, they it's it's the Virtua Fighter three of Tekken, which I guess Speaking... I, I missed that. But is is Virtua Fighter featured at all at Evo right now? Or is no, it... no, no, that no, sucks. no Sega Man, who are you? I mean, they just that's just it. They just dumped out there that are three people of in that game. A, in a hotel room. And yeah, none of them are playing Virtua Fighter because they're too busy playing Glove on Fight Groove. or Jackie Chan in Fists of Fire. Groove on Fight is yeah. a cool. Yeah, I game. mean they're not even playing Sailor Moon. Well, I, G- Jeff, just yes. to give you an idea, like Soul Calibur Six still has a presence, but not Virtua Fighter. Yeah, that's you know, like Virtua Fighter Five is a fifteen-year-old game. Also, like to be clear, it's just that they did that remaster last year. It's the only reason I ask. So, like that—that that makes sense. I'm not crazy. Like I'm wondering if it was on the stage last year, even, and uh, we don't need to answer that because we no. have another game to talk about. Speaking of Tekken Two and standouts on the PlayStation, yeah. The I mean, Legend of Dragoon. Speaking of Tekken 3, honestly, in terms of visual shit. So, yeah, it, as we do, we're going to continue the good habit of kind of explaining what you do in a game before we get into the weeds and, like, build the universe to make an apple pie or whatever. So, Legend of Dragoon is a... This is a very merciless description, but here we go. A very bog-standard, very standard issue four disc late model playstation one jrpg where and a kind of rote story takes place uh in the margins of a turn-based combat system the spin on that combat system is basically a rhythm mechanic or a timing based mechanic i don't know if it's rhythm based that that kind of works one direction so they took part of what existed in like your Paper Mario or your Super Mario RPG uh, in terms of what you do offensively, and then they did not transpose that on the defensive side uh, in terms of Vitan. Uh, and the other knob yeah, so... on that is, I guess, you have sort of a super bar that gets built. That I'm trying to think what the closest Final Fantasy analog would be because it's a limit break. It's a limit France. break, but it's offense based, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's like a like a reverse transmitter from ff9 yeah ff9 you take damage your trance goes up in legend of, legend Honestly, of dragoon you uh, deal damage it goes up i know that they were released i think near each other but there are stronger similarities between chrono cross and this game than like og final fantasy in a lot of ways a so i know yeah like they're filling up your meter with, with for surge kid mel or whatever just it felt very similar to filling up your meter for your dragoons but i digress i mean this game like you hit the attack button a circle comes up on screen you have to press x at the right time in which case you get extra damage because your character will do a like combo move if you miss time the button press you just get normal damage so it it really behooves you to hit the buttons at the right time and if you do not it's only like you said jeff it's one way like either you get the bonus or you don't which is very similar to a game we played recently, Eternal Sonata, where if you miss yeah. time your button presses, just stuff just does less damage. Everything's worse. I... Worth mentioning, before we even get into the weeds of the combat system, which, congratulations, we've gotten to the weeds of the combat system. You press the buttons rhythmically. This is a game that was meant for CRT televisions with very little input lag. Yes. Boy, howdy. Um, that was not since Parappa the Rapper 
or Incredible Crisis. Yeah, I, I've played this. Uh, I've played the, the digital version of this on a PlayStation 3, a genuinely legally yes. acquired version. And then I've been playing it on my Vita, and because I'm one of those perverts too. And that Vita experience is a hell of a lot better because it is pumping that game out pretty close to the metal straight to an OLED versus whatever emulation layer needs to run a PS1 game on a PlayStation 3 up to the projector television I'm running it on, which is like reasonably low latency, but it's never going to be zero. And that mm-hmm. like that is enough though to make it kind of miserable. <laughs> or like it just winds up have you wind up like leading your shot so to speak, right? Like I know I yeah. need to get this out a little earlier. And that feels fine to a point because at least that first set like, we're already in the weeds i guess generally people's first like little attack sequence that they can set on themselves is like a one two right so you get that first hit and then you get that combo thing comes out uh, but they start adding hits in um you know it's like chains that are like seven or yeah. eight hits long i think towards the end of the game and if they were like in rhythm like you know on you know one two three four five like that would be one thing but there's mix-ups some of them are like offbeat and like syncopated in fun ways that i think are mostly designed to just make your life shitty yeah and so that that was a bit of a a whammy for me in part because i was trying so i tried two things when i was doing this i could basically get sufficient on the three to four combos but by the time it starts to introduce five to six hit combos i just couldn't do it because i just drop the fifth or the sixth step, and then I would just get stuck on that step. So I, I was thinking to myself, okay, there has to be some sort of clue here. Why don't I, why don't I try and Tekken three this, and you know, do audio cues and kind of listen for some like hints that are in the sounds of the moves. Maybe that will help me tune in. Didn't really help. It's like, okay, what if I followed the animations of the characters and like went with that? And there's a problem with doing that, even though that started to help ever so slightly every now and again but not always the enemies but not the players in any way shape or form have the ability to counter your moves and that requires a different press different kind of input Uh, otherwise you will just immediately drop the combo and in fact the enemy will hurt you and throw you backwards and you'll lose a, a turn so because it even mixes things up there like immediately it's just very hard to learn how to do this very well especially with the more complicated and complex combos yeet yep yeah it sucks <laughs> yeah it, yeah it, 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 it kind of <laughs> reminds me of, of what gino said about like Saban's blitzes which is sometimes you just want the attack and you can only not get your points yeah and yeah. i think the biggest problem with this is the way that you level up these abilities is based off of completing an entire combo so one hit combos i maxed them out level five no problem but the ones that were like five or six hit combos like it took me hours to get used to them and the lack of like a practice dojo an area where you can kind of get your feet you know wet or like just practice stuff like the lack of a practice system just makes it to where you're entirely contingent on being able to do kind of get this rhythm in between large gaps of and pauses and it's just it, it was really hard for me yeah there is a tutorial man in that uh your hometown which jeff's really good at this shit but like you know there's like characters and a plot in this game uh and i'm sure you guys wrote down names because i didn't but uh th- yeah there's there's one man in that town who's like i'm I, do you remember how to fight with swords i helped you learn that let's see if it's still in your head and you can practice your first combo with him like kind of ad nauseum forever and they'll just be like did you get it did you get it and you can just be like no i did not or volcano like, uh the <sighs> yep we're gonna talk about the voice acting in this game double strike harpoon uh <laughs> sigh yeah but like that's kind of it like it's that dude like i guess you could keep going back to that town and practicing combos with him but otherwise you kind of have to go like get practical experience and, and, and uh, this is a game where I don't think that helps it, really. Like, it's uh, it kind of sucks. Nothing should ever make me have to get practical experience. Yeah. I'm a big baby. Just <laughs> just make it easy. I don't... Uh, look, I understand that they were trying to make this game have a little bit more involvement to the combat, 
but the way that they did it was just making the attacks sometimes screw up because you hit the button wrong instead of there being actual tactics to the the why you would do a move over another move you know those sorts of things like 90 percent of the battles are just hit the attack button hope that you get the rhythm part down so that the attack the battle ends in three attacks instead of four attacks and then boss fights you use items and your super moves but yeah it's it's really uh, i wouldn't say it's ill-advised it's just really simplistic yeah they, they, very simplistic system not a bad idea in execution kind of lacking the problem with that though uh, is that it's just not enough to maintain a game like it's fun for like the first couple of times but it's not like if that if the main selling point of this game is that it has combo systems there's that what that that weird game that gino won't shut the fuck up about that did legend of of Lagaya, the better legend of game there are other games that tried this and they're a bit more complex and they've got more meat to the bone and i just it just is very plain and even when Things get mixed up ever so slightly when you get these magical forms. Even then, it boils things down into two flavors once you get these ultimate moves. And once again, because you can't really practice some of those mechanics organically, it's really hard to get proficient at them. discussion that i guess i blocked us into so oops um and speaking of the oops sound effect this is a japan studio game and that's something worth talking about in itself because that is an organization that is kind of dead now yeah like and uh honestly it bums me out uh because to to understand i guess japan studio you kind of have to go back to the origins of the playstation and sony's entire business model really which was um for those of you who don't know um i guess younger listeners may not be aware of this heard of but the walkman yes sony was just a consumer electronics company that also it, like many zaibatsu organizations in japan kind of just touched a lot of different parts of the japanese economy but they're mostly in electronics and then kind of media stuff so film music television you know i'm sure they sell insurance somewhere like that that's what they were known they made for. the film morbius yeah and they had been involved <laughs> god damn it no we're not going to talk about morbius we can't we can't we should talk about morbius but not here what a fucking amazing dumb dumb cycle that whole thing's had um but yeah they, they were a music company uh such that they made media and they made some video games uh prior to the advent of the playstation there's the entire nintendo playstation arc of uh, Sony a history as well. A lucky engineer named Ken Kutaragi made this sound chip for the Super Nintendo. Yes, and what was nearly born out of that marriage and was sundered by certain, I guess, Dutchmen from Philips. But yes, uh, Japan Studio was formed kind of around the time the PlayStation was like, we're going to make a PlayStation born. Uh, according to Wikipedia, the date is 16 November 1993. So that's very specific but basically it was a chunk of internal sony which kind of did two things it made games and it also in kind of a very a and r music model they went out and found talent in japan and basically said hey um you know here's a budget of sorts and here's some support please make games for this thing that we're going to try to sell Mm -hmm. so japan studio is kind of this bucket that has several smaller studios kind of inside of it you had like your exact and your love and rockets and uh media vision i think um when you they start talking psychosis. about psychosis yes psychosis gets in there so japan studio strictly speaking is responsible for like a lot of weird early sony and in some sense like for people like me who are sick like good exciting sony so like crime crackers is their first game Crime Crackers hasn't been localized yet, but I'm telling you guys, as soon as it is, we should really play it, because it's wild. 
It's a first-person shooter, dungeon crawler, RPG, anime hybrid weird mess from like the you launch. You said of way the too PS1. many descriptors. Yeah, like it that was way too many descriptors. It's a crazy. It's sense. like a weird Doom clone, but your anime detective ladies in space, and everything look like it's a wild-looking game. Oh, oh, I've I've seen this. Yeah, like it. Crime Crackers this seems like it might be CD-ROM cool. energy. So, and that was like the first thing that came out of Japan Studio, strictly speaking. But like early Sony history out of there, you also get Jumping Flash, Rapid Reload, aka Ape Escape, freaking Gunner's Heaven. That's what that game was also called. Uh, Beyond the Beyond, which was in some oh, sense I their first JRPG, game. I guess. Uh, I know that game. Uh, Parappa the Rapper, the whole Arc the Lad yep. series, Intelligence Cube, like that Ghost in the Shell game that everyone is like convinced is very good. Uh, should probably it's play it. Not um, Grand Stream Saga. They published the the quintet mess on the PlayStation. How have we gotten this far, Jeff and Braden, and we still haven't played a quintet game? Because people haven't nominated the Grand Stream Saga, and you could do so by donating one dollar to Patreon. Um, yeah, that's that's my answer. Please Patreon. nominate more CRPGs. Yes, actually, that would be better. So that's the sort of the environment that this is born in so you have that track the japan studio like sony having to like find and attract talent to this platform and that formula basically working by the time this came out it's not like sony's success in the console industry was uncertain anymore like they snow plowed through like two existing companies basically at, at least after 1997 if not before and 1997 very specifically i'm talking about like the point i guess where Final Fantasy VII comes out. The Saturn was trending down in Japan already at that point, and then Final Fantasy VII kind of killed it. Like, uh, at that point, there was, yeah. like, actually no turning which, back. Which, I feel like that raises one of the biggest quandaries with this game, which is, this feels like Japan studio forced to do something that was completely unnecessary and forced them to punch below their weight and create competition for a studio that was more than happy to sell console units with or without sony's assistance that's the part that confuses me too and it makes me wonder if if it's not quite that way are you implying basically zp if i follow you this feels like uh, japan studio is being forced to compete with squaresoft directly when they were both basically locked to sony consoles non-overlapping magisteria as we would say right um or overlapping magisteria, but the circles are basically over each other. What is magisteria? Magisteria was a Stephen Gould uh, claim. I, I'll, I'll do this quick. Stephen Gould was someone who was trying to reconcile supporting evolution and being a hardcore Catholic. And he says, uh, religion and science are non-overlapping magisteria. They can be separated and not conflict with one another. So the idea is magisteria is that these are two circles that cover two different areas and none neither the twain should meet <clears throat> okay lots of ways to square that specific fun wormhole square circle yeah i i wonder about that part because according to the sources i've got online because you know i'm an exhaustive research guy and i I've lo- i love the research i love the reading the production on this game started in like 1996 huh. like this was baking for a while in some form or another huh. which is really crazy because this seems like a thing that, again, if you look at sort of the timeline here, like the the fate of how this whole like console fight in Japan, which was to be clear a two party fight, it was a fight that Nintendo just didn't show up to, was not totally settled in 1996. But by mid 1997, it was a done, like the the fight was over, like uh, there there was no reason for this. It leads to th- this game comes out basically between at least in North America, the release of Final Fantasy VIII and the release of Final Fantasy IX. Two games which did pretty good on their own, by the way. And it leads to, uh, which gets to the um, theme of the names I went for this, feels very also ran, and I think feels almost kind of vain. Like, I don't know the, the market case for this game existing when it existed is very strange. And I've not found yeah. conclusively uh, evidence for this, but it leads me to think that people in Sony, uh, Shuhei Yoshida being one of them, because he was the producer of this game, it was kind of one of the last things he like produced, produced in terms of a video game. They really believed in this product for whatever reason. 
Like they thought this was a great idea and they, they had to like really, really stretch like a three year production on a game at this point is kind of remarkable. Like final fantasy seven had like a three year development cycle and it was seen as kind of like an insane endeavor, like a, like a Hindenburg esque disaster potentially as it happens. That's not what, you know, became square, but you know, they spent a lot of time and money making final fantasy seven. If that thing had flopped, it would have been a total disaster in terms of sunk cost. Whereas I guess Sony was willing to just kind of like eat that and make this thing. Cause I guess they believed in it like that much. I mean, right. when you look it quite well, it did quite well. And also like when you look at this game and compare it to its contemporaries, like this game looks better than FF seven. It looks worse than eight looks worse than nine. It sounds bet as Sounds on par with seven, sounds worse than eight, sounds worse than nine. So when they started this ship going, this game looked like a step above pretty much every other JRPG that they could have seen. It just so happened that Squaresoft had lapped them by the time the game actually came out. I'm going to disagree with you right there. I'm going to take my gauntlet off and throw it on the ground right in front of you. I think this game actually looks quite a bit better than Final Fantasy VIII. I'd say that this looks better than 8. And it probably looks willing. better than 9 most of the time. I would say that the environment... I think that, again, I think that it's better looking than 8 and 9 because there's almost a Chrono, Cro- Chrono Cross-esque level of detail and there's just more color and particle effects. Like, there are animations in the background. There's just a more variety to the color palette of the environments. And there's a larger range to what we visited in our first disc than what I would say the first half of Final Fantasy IX. Yeah, I mean, my, I like the art styles of eight and nine more than I like the art style here. This God is damn kind it, of... Jeff, you had to awaken the beast. Now we're going to get a nine lecture from Gene. No, I mean, like, to be I'm clear, you a lecture, I'm just... I, I think the nine art style is overall more interesting and good-er. Like, I li- like, here's to quote me, I think Final Fantasy IX's art style is overall more interesting to look at than this. To be clear, this went for but, a yes. little more realism. Yeah, right. Hundred percent. This game yeah. pushes the hardware in a genuinely impressive way. Yeah, yeah. That's that's. I think this game when you're when you set off on it now for whatever reason it it I think uses mid is it MIDI music? It sounds like it's MIDI um, most for most of the sound. Um, it's not really pushing the CD quality audio that hard, but like you could see that this game was a technical showcase at the time it came out, and so. If you're so like something you would see in an episode in a uh, issue of EGM being like, look at these fucking graphics. Yeah, this what is in your game score. The music on this game is actually kind of a weird thing. Um, it had two composers on it and one of them, they, they didn't collaborate directly, like at any point, uh-huh. really. Um, they let's see. I've got Takeo Miratsu and then Dennis Martin. So if you can gather, one of those is not uh, native Japanese. Uh, Dennis Martin was based out of America. And this was his first video game he'd ever worked on, actually. Um, If, you know, the sole arbiter of truth in the 21st century, Wikipedia is telling the truth anyway. Yeah, they they kind of had delegated chunks to this. This was originally going to be a sole work of Dennis Martin. Um, And I don't have his background in front of me anymore. But when he discovered that it was going to be like four CD, like a, you know, a big honking thing, he kind of balked at that. So they cut up some of the duties and split them with Takeo Maratsu. And let's see, Maratsu did the music for Jumping Flash uh, is the one thing I've got in front of me, clearly. Oh, a game that a lot of PlayStation fanboys like to say is like a seminal work of the PlayStation catalog. It's good. I like that game a lot. It's quirky. Yeah. It's it's not gr- yeah, I, I, it's not great. I don't think it's aged very well. It's not Super Mario sixty four or anything. Like I'm not Ooh. a nut, but like it's there. There's an experimental, fun, freewheeling nature to that game that I enjoy. I'd say this. Um, I feel like that was the whole one of the whole points of Japan Studios that they were freewheeling and highly experimental. And this is like the complete antithesis of being experimental. <laughs> this is like distilling a JRPG to yeah, like the most basic like what we get in the story that we encountered has to be like the spark nosed versions of joseph campbell's heroic cycle how to be a man 101 and combined with 
just a lot of weird by the numbers plotting. I will say, I don't think we've kind of talked about things that we enjoyed about this game. Sure. So first off, I want to say that the menu system and the UI with like managing characters and equipment, I thought the UI and the UX of this game was demonstrably and objectively better than a lot of the contemporary Final Fantasy games that came out, especially Final Fantasy VIII, whose menu system makes it almost impractical to learn it without the help of an expert by you, which is exactly what happened to me. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. On top of that, and, and we can get into how it's not, like, it's incremental improvement whenever you interact with that system, but, like, it is easier to wrap your mind around. I'm between, I'm, I'm kind of split when it comes to the overworld. I do like the linearity because it prevents you from getting lost and just trapped in these death spirals where it's just endless random encounters, but there really were times where it's like, I really need to go up, right, down, then left, and now, I yeah, guess, you're going to force me to go through, like, three or four interstitial levels no matter what. It, it's but a point crawl. It's a point crawl, and it's also kind of there. And I like the potions doing percentage health rather than them being tiered. I think I've warmed up to that, even though I started off not liking that. And what else did you guys like uh, about this game? I, As I looks said, good. I think this game looks good. I like the the music that plays when you're in the inventory menu. Yeah. <laughs> this this very chill. A pretty weak battle theme, I would also say, in like a victory yes. theme. Yeah. Um, yeah, especially for the songs you will hear the most in the game. Yeah. I'll let everyone else say what they I, I'll like. I'll say this. I said this on I, the stream when I was streaming it. There's something about this game that feels like a Saturday morning cartoon. Like I mean, the plot it's, is secondary a... to showing you flashy visuals and like guys being dudes and we're being cool badasses. I'm going to take my superpower and pop it off. And now the bad guy's dead. Like there's something very Saturday morning cartoon, Hanna-Barbera, like it's Batman, the animated, not even it's Batman. It's very animated. Super Sentai. Yeah, it's yes. a Super Sentai. Yeah. Thing. They're color coded for Christ's sake. Like it's very Super Sentai. 100%. And I, I would say the thing I like the most about this game is the names of human beings. <laughs> yeah. That's my oh, favorite. I mean, Brayden, yeah. please... Tell me which is your favorite name of oh, a human. Well, Gino, I guess you've you forced my hand. You see, the thing I actually love about this game is how fucking terrible the localization is. Yes. But it has gifted us, gifted us the people with a Lavitz Slambert. The yes. greatest JRPG character name. It's incredible. La and Lavitz actually, Slambert. He's... He's actually in the game and in the story. He's actually like the best character in the game of what we played. Um, yes. Dart Field, Lavitz Slambert, and then no one else gets last names. Shanna. And Shana. Shana. Sh no, it's not Shana. I'm going to call you out publicly on radio. It's not I, Shana. I called her Shana. She, that's her name. She's Shana. Sword of Shanara over here. Shanana, everyone's favorite Woodstock performer from that first show uh but yeah like this it is shocking that this is a first party sony game and it got what i can only describe as one of the worst official translations i've seen of a first party game yeah in a very long time like i maybe like we can go back to the nes and s nes era of video games but during this period of time my brothers in christ Alexander O. Smith was available. <laughs> like he, he was, and, and Ted Woolsey was available. He there was were too busy were, translating Vagrant Story. There were people who which were, this game is contemporaneous with. Yeah, for, which is insane, right? When you look at how, like if this game had come out in 1995, I think that would have made it. Like if if this game had the translation it did does in ninety five, I'd be like, oh yeah. But this game came out in mid two thousand. Yeah, it's really wild how bad it is when you consider that part of it it is stilted and sentences like are technically correct the best kind of correct the way it felt to me is it's like everyone is delivering lines that are legible and readable and communicate their own meaning but none of them are in conversation with each other like there's no conversational dialogue that really works in this game at all it is just sentences that no were translated in abstract to each other yeah well they, it's they... either the bad translation or the overt sexism, which we'll talk about later, <laughs> also uh, of, of the dialogue. 
Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. I, this it's a lot of characters saying grammatically correct things that do not sound like a human being is speaking. It's it reads like someone put a script into Google Translate and then just went with whatever came out. Yeah. It'll and, be a long relationship we shall have. Yep. Technically it, a sentence. It, it okay. Definitely a little bit of like dialogue written or translated by a non-native English speaker energy. If they release that monster in the battle, it will me, be a total genocide. Exactly. Gave me some troll two vibes. I will yeah. I will let you follow them, although not to Helena, to hell. Like things that don't like hell yeah. Not conversational. You know? Like it's every single line in this game I feel like I need to speak yeah, stay in the most like I am Lavitz Slambert, I, a warrior. I posted a screen cap from last battle in the Discord of um, Arzak talking to one of the NPCs in last battle. Actually, maybe I just shared that with you guys, but th the localization of last battle for the Sega Genesis is a real piece of shit. Um, yeah, I posted it to you guys. I'm going to post this in the general Discord. It's what it, That's what it reminded me of, though. It's just characters like weirdly talking past each other. My my absolute favorite one, and I just was cackling in glee. Take this, please. Once decided, it's hard to take it back. It's a man thing. Ooh, incredible! Boy. Like the thing is, they could have gotten like I've I've watched a I think GameSack posted a video recently about working designs and like what exactly they were up to Dude, around this period. Working designs and like say what you will about working designs and their ability to insert weird Clinton and Bush era jokes, but. They took the time to make sure their grammar was good. Yeah, like they wound up ultimately writing, I guess, sort of characters in conversation with each other, right? Like a, a contained world as opposed to, again, lines that were just taken in isolation. Yes, Arzak, hey. I am the only one who can save the world. Elisa, Arzak, save the world. Like a, a raw text file of nothing but katakana. <laughs> Yeah. Special, huh? Fine. I don't capitalize on a woman's frailty anyway. It's good stuff. I, okay, so do put, we want to talk I'll put about... it this way. I think that I would like this game less if it was translated oh, better. Yeah. If it was oh, yes. The, the correctly. Bad, this is 100% a like killer clowns from outer space situation. <laughs> if it was written better, it would be worse. It would be one like, less uh, thing to keep you like, what What the hell are they going to set on fire in this next turn? Um, again, like like Eternal Sonata, if that game was any better written, it would. that's a disservice to that game. It's better that it's bad. Silent Hill Revelations, better that it is the way it is than a better translated, better written thing. <sighs> we'll get into the story later, but it should be noted that it's Legend of Dragoon. There does come the point where your characters slowly but surely become dragoons. And boy, howdy, the dragoons. So the game puts a lot of value on you becoming a dragoon and seeing these long animations to cast spells. And the good news is, is that you can shorten the transformation animation length but you can't shorten the spell length, which it's a JRPG. Goddamn from crazy! The PlayStation. There were there were era. JRPGs that allowed you to shorten the animations of spells. That that is a thing that even contemporaries of this game did. Like, however, what? However, Final Fantasy eight, Nine did that. Yeah, Nine, uh, okay. and I think even Eight did that. Or there was no nah, Eight. Eight gave you something to do as you watched the animations. Yeah. It oh, gave right. you a boost button. Right, 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 right. But Nine did this, and like. I think there's even an example outside of Square that they let you do this. But the Dragoon mode is weird that this is like one of the big selling points is you get to see these Super Sentai moves and obviously, you know, the, the voice acting. But it's a really bland kind of weird mechanic that doesn't end up feeling as awesome as the game thinks it should feel awesome because you have two options, a physical attack, which you need to like basically shadow hearts time the button press or cast magic problem is with the magic system is that especially at the start they don't give you enough magic points to keep that pool of points up 
and you know the mat magic point restoring stuff is not in a frequency like the final fantasy games or even like the tales of games where those ethers are ethers are available on tap and i don't know they kind of don't do as much as you think and the synergies where you like do the fusion attack they're not as impressive as you want and there were just times where it's like yeah i could do a dragoon mode right now but this is just a battle against some randos and i bet the animation here is going to take longer than if I just mash the buttons. I'm not going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. It does lend to the, I guess, Sentai nature of the whole thing, because, like, the... Not that this is a unique to this game thing either, but it feels, like, particularly apropos here. The only time it's worth really dragging out the heavy guns is in, like, a boss fight, right? Like, the the, the Power Rangers didn't get the Zords out to fight the putties, right? Like, it's, it's a waste of... You know, like the yeah. economy of action doesn't really make sense there, but it does lead to, I think, like very stilted feeling combat where it's like, all I'm doing is saving this stuff up for the boss fights. Yeah. And for sure. And the animations themselves also just are slow because you have to do this rhythm gamey <sighs> thing oh, yeah. just to so, do a single attack. Me and Jatsu time this. The length of the opening pan is 10 seconds. So just stop and think about yeah. that. So if you get into six battles, that's one minute of your time just down the fucking drain. Yeah. The end battle pan is eight and a half seconds long. So basically same rules there apply. So just in the opening and end pan, you're losing anywhere between one and a half to two minutes after just six or seven battles. Just looking at these animations. Yeah. And that's discounting <laughs> the length of animations for enemies, which can be super slow too. Right. Yeah, I want to be clear that I'm like a consistent person about this shit. I complain about nine, eights, guilty of this too. Eight, talking about Final Fantasies, eight and nine. Um, seven, I think, is the only game on the PlayStation in terms of like Final Fantasy over animatedness that like just about gets away with it. It's like just snappy enough to not make my brain hurt. Th- I thought Chrono Cross was going to be the worst uh, that I'd seen. And Chrono Cross is definitely worse than nine in terms of like kind of slow and over animated and kind of overtaxing the system in terms of like polygon budget and shit. But this is worse. Like the, this feels worse almost a hundred percent of the time. Like yeah. it's, it's, it's unfathomably slow and it extends outside of combat because even like sluggish by PSX JRPG. Standards. Yeah. Like even getting which in and out of the, like, which the, makes the additions even harder, yeah, like getting in and out of the menu, like hitting start or hitting triangle or whatever the hell it is to get that menu screen up in like most games is like damn near instantaneous in this game. You hit, I guess it's triangle and there's like a min, a second and a half pause because it's queuing up separate music that it has to start up. And then you're in the menu. And then exiting that menu also, there's like a second and a half lag. And again, we're talking about a second. Like, who gives a shit? Like, stop crying. Play it on like 2x speed. Like, whatever. But, it, but it's a 40-hour JRPG. Yeah, That's the problem. You're going to be menuing a lot in this game to like play optimally, to level up all your shit, and change gear, etc., etc., etc. So like the idea of like every time you want to have this interaction you're losing like a couple seconds just waiting again just underline the word waiting it's like virtually never good see the metal gear solid 3 podcast we're gonna talk about here pretty soon like like it's a it's a bummer they budgeted in weird ways they prioritized very very specifically visual spectacle at the expense of having like a snappy rpg which is the thing again right. that is possible to do on this platform have you heard of suikoden yeah our second highest rated game barely snappy final fantasy 7 even barely snappy a lot of the time like getting in and out of fights takes a second but it's nowhere near this final like none of those games are as obsessed with like agonizingly panning around kind of an enclosed little polygon environment of just like look we knocked a tree over and there's the ruin of a house and it's like i really don't fucking care guys like i really don't care See, and <laughs> like that's where this game starts to start start to break for me it's just it's not necessarily one critical error in this game it's just a bunch of fiddly annoying bullshit right 32 yeah. items doesn't sound like a problem god damn god damn only having 32 item slots which are separate from your weapon and armor slots yeah which is a mercy because there are games that don't even allow that so you know and, and they probably even saw separating those two 
categories of thing as being merciful. But then, but like, but you, then, know, you know, look at all Jeff, the competition. You know what some games do when they only give you like a limited number of slots? They let you stack items up to a certain degree. Sure. But you can't. I mean, you know, people sure like them Dragon Quest and more. Earthbound games, despite not letting you do that. Right. Maybe you like, should use your items. All items are meant to be also used. Also, that part, I guess. But like, I don't. Know. I don't enjoy finite inventory space all that much, to be perfectly honest. But I see why you do it, at least in a like institutional Japan way, of like, well, very successful games in this genre have finite inventory slots. Ergo, we should just do that because clearly it will sell, right? But why, you know? Like, Final Fantasy walked away from that earlier in the decade, basically. Like, I don't remember when they actually just completely shit-canned, like, an inventory cap, or at least created, like, you know, an inventory... A hundred. Yeah, like, an inventory large enough to make it not matter, but I think it was four, if not three, right? Like, this was a solved problem, in some sense. Yeah, and I, I will say, like, this game also... Those other JRPGs you mentioned, Jeff, that are kind of contemporaries of this one... They tend to have ways that allow you to play the game where it is less sluggish. Like you can avoid battles. You some, you know, games you can play in such a way that you only see the attack animations. You don't have to do summonings. Yeah. But this game, every single part of it is slow and sluggish. There's no there, way around yeah. it unless you find a way to just not get into combat. Yeah. Like there, there is, is no an fast item button. that is a repel equivalent. But it doesn't it, seem to work for anything but monsters who are way lower level than you. Or when it does work, it's like 20 seconds, 20 or 30 seconds of relief. Yeah. But we've been enough. talking a lot about the mechanics, uh, gentlemen. Uh, um, well, because the story is, is if, yeah, is gar- as if well, the rest of the game is, is kind of not remarkable. Yeah, I'm not going to say it's garbage. It's just like Dart is a boy. He's a lad whose uh, village is attacked by an evil he's empire. The Red Ranger. Yeah, the Red Ranger's house is destroyed by Rita Repulsa. And then his girlfriend, the White Ranger, uh, Shayna, gets kidnapped by Rita Repulsa. And then he has to go save her. Uh, so he recruits the Green Ranger, Lavitz Slambert, uh, from jail. And then they form a party. And then they go back to Lavitz Slambert's home uh, to tell... meet his mom. Yeah, meet his mom. Uh, and the, the mom affirms traditional gender roles. Uh, and then you oh. get Lavitz's... <laughs> buddy uh the king of the land that doesn't like Rita repulsa to help you uh go to go to combat and then you, you go and you fight the evil empire ta-da and then you eventually learn how to summon zords yeah and by that i mean so take on dragoon form before we get to the end of it two things kind of pop up one this game has like seven or eight subplots and it's not really clear in terms of what is the actual main plot. You know that there's this evil emperor that you need to fight and tackle and defeat. But, like, there's the Winglies. There's the, you know, the dragon campaign. There's, like, what is a dragoon? There's there's um, 11,000 years of in-universe history to account for in the lore of And they game. reference different eras of that 11,000-year history, like, without kind of cluing you into what these different events and these different eras are. 11,000 years of history with the quality of the translation we previously discussed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's this game is a real lore is not a substitute for story example. Like just because you have a lore Bible that goes back X number of years where there, where events happened, you still need the moment to moment story to be coherent and interesting. And this game fails that test, unfortunately. And the second recurring theme of the story going up to the end is, <laughs> The rampant sexism. Okay, so yes, we yes we all played up to the end of disc one, yes. uh, and boy howdy, this this game is like I am a I am a woman and therefore weak. I am filled with feelings and blood. Uh, let me prepare you a meal, Dart. Shayna, you should not be in in the battles because you are a woman and you will be destroyed by the monsters. And I must keep you safe. I am weak and demure. Dart, you are my hero. Dart, you are hurt. Let me heal you, for I am a woman and know how to do the healing arts. It, it, you might think I we're exaggerating. Woman, but I am tough. Yeah. You might think we're exaggerating, of- but almost every single story beat revolves in some way around Dart being sexist to Shayna. 
Uh, and Lavitz, Slambert and yet, also. And yet, and yet, she is universally in love, in, infatuated by Dart, even though Dart is not an interesting character or just we don't even understand what is the origin of this relationship. It's just their childhood man friends. needs heteronormative relationship. Otherwise, it's not a role-playing game because this game is for guys. And like the one good plot arc in this first disc was you know just lavitz and dart just being bros right like that was the best character work in the game it's that yeah, we saw just, and just it bros being works, dudes bros being but dudes it's yes. really telling that a male-on-male relationship arc or just you know friendship is the best told part of this story so far well there there's still three more discs don't worry oh, yeah. um, don't worry so but i'm I guess sure they, it'll be worth playing them the only other thing is, is like, I, I, we talked about the linearity of the overworld. Boy, howdy, I wish the overworld didn't have random encounters. Um, yeah, that's like the overworld in this game. There is an overworld. It's basically a line that is drawn between different locations. Sometimes there's a branch. Most of the time it's a straight line. But when you're on the overworld map, as you said, ZP, you can run into random battles. But the upside of overworlds in most games that have them is that there's some degree of exploration, right? That you can walk over to a spot and, oh, this place is locked and I can't go in there yet. Or it's a dead end. Maybe if I come back here later, it will have something in it. Or, oh, I found this little village that is non-mission critical, but it adds a little flavor to the world. This game manages to kind of, it has all of the fiddly bits of running into random battles and padding out the run length that world maps sometimes have with none of the upside, really. Like, the upside is the exploration, and this game removes it. So I really wish this game had almost an unlimited saga-style world map where you just pick a location, you move there instantaneously, and then you don't have to worry about it. But that's unfortunately not how it works. Yeah, it's a network map, basically, that you're navigating, right? It's totally fine. Like, I think, I don't know, I don't necessarily mourn the death of classic JRPG overworld maps all that much like they 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 serve their purpose they were kind of a visual metaphor for a thing there's other ways to convey the concept of going from space to space there's you know the plenty of jrpgs that are examined like the entirety of like what's the point of this anyway like i don't know games that take place in one city right you know Mm -hmm. we're, we're playing one right now spoilers for lightning returns basically or one city it's kind of one like area but like there, there's lots of ways to sort of conceptualize that but if you're going to strip that down and like as you said it's got none of the inherent like advantages of that are really conveyed it's just winds up feeling kind of like busy work especially when you start throwing yeah, encounters it, it, onto it it pays all of the costs without any of the benefits and that's like i don't think i think world maps are a deliberate choice you can use it as a way to condense space but still have a sense that you're moving from place to place add some exploration to a game that otherwise would be a lot of dungeon crawling um and town crawling like i think there's inherent value to changing the scale which is what the world map does it goes from you know on the ground scale to world scale fine but this game doesn't do anything with it 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 takes it pays the price and doesn't reap any benefits, and that's it's a shame. I think that this game has a world map because it felt it needed to, but maybe they just, you know, it's four discs already. I don't know if fitting an entire world map with real exploration would have made sense. But I, at that point, if you're not going to do anything really interesting with a world map, just don't have it. It's fine. And also the worst part is is the fact that you do bump up against the same interstitial levels that are in between the main dungeons, which... <sighs> okay, the one part yeah. of the game design that really drove me crazy is repeating dungeons. So in disc one, you go to the Helena prison twice. You go to certain towns two to three times. Gotta justify and that all, length. Gotta justify all, them four discs. All during that time, you go through the same forest tile, go through the same marsh tile. And when you get to that area with in the dragon's nest, you have to actually go back there and take the back exit and then come back to it a third time. And it's just the design of it ends up causing more headaches than like, oh, I'm exploring these environments and learning new ways to get out of here, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it, you're, you're entirely right. Like, yeah, because it's not a real world map where there's varied locations or a, a, a realistic map to explore, since it's all just nodes on a you know tree, you 
have to step through the same mid interstitial nodes all the time. And then you have to navigate the same stupid little, uh, pre-rendered backgrounds with people running over it. And they're, and they're and very busy pre-renders in this game too. Like, um, I, I think I talked about this in the nine episode or maybe in the, I don't know. We've talked about a bunch of PS1 RPGs at this point over the existence of deep listens. Right. I feel like every time one of the later ones has come up, I've probably complained about it. So I apologize. People hear me do this again. But, like, this feels like the real death knell of this as a mode. Like, the the the, the, the entire reason for the pre-rendered background with, you know, polygonal characters running around in front of them mode of gameplay was a adaptation to what the PS1 could do, basically. Like, you couldn't render this whole thing in polygons to scale at a visual fidelity that you would have wanted. So there were games that would render an entirely polygonal world and that have 3D characters moving in it, and you had to make certain sacrifices around that, and you wind up with games that look like Metal Gear Solid or Vagrant Story at the high end, and then a lot of kind of dreck sort of below that, basically, versus a lot of JRPGs opted for this like very pre-rendered background, sort of classic 1930s Hollywood painted on look with characters sort of moving yep. around in front of them. That's like the most generous description you can yeah. give the shit, by the way. This game feels like this or Final Fantasy IX, I guess, or Chrono Cross. I don't know. It's kind of a style choice, like the logical conclusion. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the format kind of died after this. Like yeah. Final Fantasy X yeah. has a couple sequences that they creep in. Uh, and it's usually like, people's apartments and shops where they opted for like a static background or they aren't even static, but they're just pre-rendered with, you know, polygonal characters running around in front of them. But I think even by 10 two, they were virtually all excised and it was just like an entirely polygonal world. Yeah. And I, like you said, the PlayStation, you could spend your polygons on high res characters, or you could spend your polygons on an entire world with polygonal backgrounds and everything, but you couldn't do both. Um, because of the hard limits on the number of polygons a PlayStation could render at once. So this game chose high-resolution characters relative to, you know, its yeah. era. Uh, or you could have, you know, your Vagrant stories where it's a lot of very tight rooms, but it's all polygonal. Um, or your Metal sure. Gears, you know, your those sorts of things. crises. Yeah. Exactly. So this game chose pre-rendered backgrounds with, more high res characters and you know unfortunately these characters they're they look good for the era for sure but there's a definite aesthetic to the ps1 psx era of yes. 3d graphical design and it made me this game made me nostalgic for it because i think that one like the quality of animation is good um it's over animated sure but like the fluidity of that those their animations the character animations are undeniably smooth and great for a game of this era and the background work and kind of the animating bits that you sometimes see are just astounding sometimes like the water textures in particular amazing for a game of this era and the shiny surfaces and the shading and the particle effects yeah very impressive right? special kudos to the particle like it's genuinely a technical tour de force when you get to that final dungeon and there's those wisps of like glowing smoke it just like wow that that impressed me. Um, yeah, consistently, like, doing technical trickery with lights and particles that I wasn't expecting to see uh, in my runtime with the game. Anyway, I can't imagine they didn't save some, like, particularly showy stuff for the end of the game, which I have not seen. Uh, but, you know, like, even just, like, the Dragoon transformations are impressive in their own right, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I sound like I'm damning this thing with faint praise. To be clear, though, it, no, like, it I, is a looker on the system. Like, it it's is a there. looker. It's it's a definite technical looker. And it's, again, why I sometimes compare this with, like, Saturday morning cartoons. Because not a lot of substance to those early Gen 1 Transformers animated series because the purpose was to sell you cartoon figurines, right? Um, but they looked good at the time. And they were cool. And they made you feel like a badass. 
And that's kind of what this game was, which leads me to what I feel like I discovered in streaming this game, because whenever I stream this game, the same two or three people would comment like, oh, I love this game. This is one of my favorite PS1 games. And it's like I, I had to probe them. I had to talk to them. And it became pretty clear that all of these people boiled down into one of two categories. Either one, they were like eight or nine, and this was their first JRPG. This was the gateway game for them. They played this game before seven. Like, there are people who played this game before seven, eight, nine Final Fantasies. They did not play Tales of Games. They did not play uh, Xenogears. They started with Legend of Dragoon because this had a huge marketing campaign and, you know, was on the front of EGM and all sorts of magazines, and they started with this. The other kind of category is is that people kind of like what this game represents, which is kind of technical ambition up the wazoo and this kind of self-perception that the genre has not kind of tried to move the ball as ambitiously as, you know, this era. And I'm not saying that I agree, but these people definitely exist. But hmm. I do I do want to kind of like not be condescending about this game. I do want to like for all the problems that I feel like we listed, I do feel like there was a value to this game for just like people got into JRPGs because of this game. And that's kind of cool, right? Yeah. yeah. This game has a lot of the FF7. I played this because it was highly spoke of. I had a PlayStation. It's the only JRPG I ever played. And boy, I enjoyed it. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. But as a, you know, a show that plays a lot of JRPGs or a lot of RPGs, when you compare this game to other contemporaries yeah, and you compare this game to things that came after it, it just doesn't hold up. It, it is also context. important to, like, be careful about making that comparison with Seven because Seven has a legacy that is incredibly important. And I, I would say that, obviously, Seven holds up significantly better than this game. That's the other, like, like this game, content. like, the legacy of this game is kind of interesting. The The sales part of this, I think, is, like, kind of crazy because there's this notion that this game was like a real unit shifter or something and it and it absolutely like this game it sold over a million copies it sold copies. over a million copies which like is not nothing but we're talking about like one of the five best selling video game platforms of all time you know the top of that list are games that were selling at like a 50% attach rate to PlayStation's like period like you know th this was torched by final fantasy eight and nine and probably actually i don't know the sales figures for chrono cross it wasn't i'm looking this yeah, up it, it's not like a, a a rousing sales success like a crazy seller people bought it but it, it wasn't totally nuts i hold on i have numbers, got numbers. legend of dragoon uh according to uh sony it is the 74th highest selling uh psx game at 1.3 million copies, right below Tomb Raider Chronicles, the fourth or fifth Tomb Raider game from Core That's Design. Okay, and Need for Speed High Stakes, and right above Pac-Man World and Jet Moto 2. Yeah, so try that on. We're talking about Jet Moto 2 sales, and like the top of that list, to be clear, I think is like Gran Turismo. Gran Turismo sold 10, 000, 10 million yeah, copies. Yeah, like, you know, scale, right? Again, um, 1.3 million units, like, that's more video games than any of us are probably ever going to sell, ever, right? Tekken 3 sold 8.3 million copies. Like, so... Final Fantasy VII sold 10 million copies. So, j just for perspective, right? Seeing videos of people talk about this game being, like, a rousing sales success, it, 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 it's like, that. Uh, you're categorically wrong in some sense. Not to diminish selling 1.3 million copies but, of the game. Like 1.3 million copies is still a lot of copies, yeah. even today. Yeah, like that's that's fairly. Wow, impressive. I did not realize Final Fantasy VII was the second highest selling PlayStation game. Yep. Every yeah. nickel they spent goes, on that game, they got back. It was on Pepsi's Gino. Oh, I know, but the Gran Turismo, then FF7, then Gran Turismo 2, then FF8. Yeah. Woo. Yeah. Then Man. Tekka 3. That's wow. And then Harry Potter the Philosopher's Stone. Hell yeah. Fuck turfs. And you that's can do a that. Late one. Yeah. That's 2001. Yeah. Where, yeah. What is seven, Dragon Quest Seven is in that top 10, probably, right? Uh, it's it's 20. Oh, wow. Dragon Quest Seven. Uh, it is. So Dragon Quest Seven's at about 4 million copies, 4,100,000. Yeah. Um, so it goes <laughs> Gran Turismo, FF7, Gran Turismo 2, FF8, Tekken 3, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, 
Crash 2, Crash Bandicoot Warped, Tomb Raider, Metal Gear Solid, Crash Bandicoot, the original, Tomb Raider 2, Tomb Raider 3, Resident Evil 2, Tekken 2, Final Fantasy 9, Resident Evil, the first one, Spyro, Tomb Raider, the last revelation, and then Dragon Quest 7. And then Rayman, wow. Yeah, like, it's a really crazy list, and there really was kind of, like, something yeah. for everyone there. Again, you know, this was a system that basically murdered Sega and almost murdered Nintendo. <laughs> wild sales list uh the other legacy part of this i guess i'd like to mention is there are interviews with shuhei yoshida again he was at japan studio and uh around this time kind of got bumped up into the upper echelons of the sony device basically he was i think president of the company during the like playstation 4 era for at least a period anyway he has said in interviews that he was aware that there was a sequel in production at some point in Japan studio for this game uh, around the time of the launch of the PlayStation 2 and said at that point he was no longer with Japan studio so like his working knowledge of what exactly was going on was kind of limited just to how things were stovepiped off but clearly there was not a Legend of Grune 2 that was released and I don't think there's even like a beta or like anything has ever been shown they were making Ape Escape 3 yeah like you know other priority like to eco <laughs> ah, eco is so good but yeah to wit like this game came out was a modest success sold over a million copies and it didn't really even need to exist for this to be a successful platform anymore <laughs> like this seems like kind of a weird labor of love i guess and people seem to love it like the, this found an audience so that audience is like very vocal like a ZP, like your experience of having people come into um, a a Twitch chat and talk about their love for this game, it, that's not like a weird one off. Like the people online who are still evangelizing this game really evangelize it. Yeah, yeah. it it really does. Uh, someone in the Twitch chat right now is saying, "Yeah, it's a hedge in case Square stopped making games for PlayStation." That makes well, that that definitely seems like it would make sense. I feel like but, uh, that was always the story with the this generation in particular is everyone got scared, especially when, especially after this generation, when people brought up the boogeyman of EA pulled sports games or EA pulled out of making sports game for the Dreamcast. We can't have that. We got to create internal studios. Yeah, we're going to build our own blackjack and hookers, etc. Remember when the Xbox created its own sports brand and the only thing of permanence was the top spin franchise? I like Rally Sport Remember Challenge. Remember when the GameCube was supposed to have an exclusive baseball game? Yeah. It was. <laughs> Remember when so Sega made their own sports games and then they became the 2K games and then 15 years later they said, hey Spike Lee, what if you made a story mode? I do. I do remember that. Should we rank this thing? Is there anything else worth saying? Like this game, uh, I, I guess I need it, success. It is fair to ask because yeah. uh, traditional off the deep end rules that we've been kind of neglecting is uh, a two thirds vote on whether or not we keep playing this because someone uh, would like us to keep playing this. I just think that the second disc is something I would be interested in just seeing. If you guys don't want to, I understand. I feel like what we would get out of a discussion of disc two is questionable, but those voices in my chat kept saying, oh, don't worry, the, the stuff happens in the story. Oh, yeah, the, the so, a lot of things come to fruition. And also, everyone told me that the second disc was significantly shorter. I don't know how much, but they said that. Uh, this might actually be a case of Woolpaw's Law, where we end up playing the second disc and everything we've just said still holds. I just don't know. The combat system is the problem in many ways, and I don't know how that gets better. I'm going to throw so, around the phrase sunk cost fallacy. Here's here's my thing, and I, to, to be actually kind of serious, I like people who are contributing to this show 
like that actually kicking in money they've made to help fund this i that like i want to honor that so when they nominate games i want to give them like actual consideration and let you know that even if i don't like these games that much i want to give them a fair shake and not just try to make you feel bad and put you down okay because like but the person who nominated this was that is my point precisely never played it um this is just m's nomination so i could give a shit (laughs) um rest in piss m you suck okay come at me we love you m (laughs) step to me yeah i dare you step on me (laughs) no like it when your cat meows very loudly into your microphone during the podcast or resets your game that you're playing on m your game sucks and i'll flatten you if you dare to challenge me on this okay what it's like you you can't get to me anyway look so what i'm on the other coast (laughs) You can't get me. Um, yeah, I, I, like uh, if this was a Patreon game, in all seriousness, I would consider it. It's not. It's not. We have okay. people who care. There okay. are there are patrons who are clearly care about this game, talking to us in the Discord. So like, I'm I'm really almost over the edge, but I don't. I don't. I I think I get it. I think I get it. I, I would say so to to kind of highlight what you guys are talking about. I do think that the last handful of bosses, and especially the dungeons, we didn't really talk a lot about the dungeons in this game, but they are very rote and of the era. They're very stock. Yeah, they're very stock. A lot of switches and lever puzzles. I really a lot of shout outs to that prison dungeon design. It's in terms of like bad dungeons, we can talk about in like certain award categories. The like looping nature of that prison dungeon it was just kind of like the same environment texture that you'd run into three times they would just like you know move a switch or open a gate slightly differently each one of them but it was basically like a loop of three screens to go through and um i found that to be a little bit disorienting um and then he coupled that with the freaking elevators to get up and down and uh, i did not enjoy my time in the prison um Oh, that was like the Black Castle or the uh, the Helena, Helena prison. prison. Helena yeah. prison. Yeah, oh. I, I the do final feel dungeon, like I the Black Castle, I thought was way worse, but and had it the same was. Problem. Yeah, I guess, but like as an introduction to like what this game has in store, not a great one, I guess. Is what I'm suggesting here. Yeah, and I feel I should shout out like we did have some questions in the Discord, yes. like uh, how how did anyone think this game was great back in the day? I think we covered yeah. that the most. Like some people, it was the first JRPG they played. It legitimately looks better than almost any other game on the PlayStation in some degrees, in some ways. Um, it, it technically very impressive, sure. has a Super Sentai feel, very grokkable uh, story that, you know, it, it it's fun to a certain yeah. extent. So th- the um, same and- person uh, also wrote, and uh, I guess we've mentioned this maybe in the last episode. I'll just read verbatim. Do you think that the fan translation that has patch notes such as fix the game dialogue so it sounds like human beings speaking would make the game better or worse? To wit, there is a fan translation for this game. And by all accounts, it's like a dramatic improvement. Um. Maybe we've done a disservice by not using that, I suppose. I can't discount that. Like, I don't know if this game reading better would make my time with it like my issue is not necessarily like the story or dialogue again we kind of went into like some of the charm is in like the uh, from another time tier translation scuffed yeah the scuffy um but i guess on the same token come on lads like this like i I feel like this question is in some sense like would i play final fantasy 7 with a fan translation and my answer to that at this point is probably just because I've played through that game, I think two or three times now. So seeing a different and in some sense better, let's say more grown up, I guess maybe this fan translation are good. Like, I don't know that like, I, I would consider doing that. Yeah. So um, maybe I would say this, a fan translation has never been the sole reason why I replay a video game. Hmm. Fair. And I, I also think uh, we had another question. The Q- the QTEs, like we have lived a world where twenty years of yes. quick time events have been imposed upon us. This was one of the games that made the quick time. This yes. and <clears throat> Super Mario RPG, Paper Mario, like this is one of the games that uh, 
highlighted Active that sort time. of thing. You know what? No, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna double back on that. That is fine if you did not grow up with the laser disc arcade <laughs> era where I like didn't. Dragon Slayer, Cliffhanger, and Road Blaster, and even like the weird Time Gal, baby Japanese version of QTE, like Super Don Quixote, Time Gal, or Road Blaster, yeah. but like QTEs were a venerable part of the arcade scene, especially in the Japanese arcade scene for oh, quite yeah. some time. And the way that this game went about using them feels very much like that Time Gal Road Blaster. Ninja Hayate. Ah, yeah. Jeff knows what I'm talking about. I mean, look, I am your number one rhythm game pervert in the entire Deep Listens community. And I'm also the top Shenmue pervert in the entire Deep Listens community. So the idea of QTE adjacent rhythm based combat is kind of something that was made for me, like in a way. Like it's a uh, very designed to tickle the lower part of Jeff's brain. It is, but it's it's very telling that many of the people who worked on Parappa the Rapper made this game, and this is how this is the core mechanic of the game. Came out of the same studio as Parappa the Rapper, yes. And again, the CRT. The director of major. this game worked on uh, Super Mario RPG. There you go. Yep. So like th- these things kind of add up, and like for me, they don't overcome the. Yeah, but it's kind of slow, and the story is fairly basic. Parts of it. They're, those are big hurdles for me to personally overcome. That doesn't mean I hate it. That doesn't mean it's bad. I'm not trying to dissuade people from enjoying this game. I think it's actually kind of fine. But when it comes to things I want to continue play, like actively, if I was given a choice to continue playing this or anything else, particularly stuff that people have uh, literally paid money for us to have a look at, no way. I, I can't do that. So... I think I think Jeff I will I will retract my proposal because I think that you are correct. I think we've given this game its due. We've played a significant portion of it and I don't want to take away from yeah. the contributions and proposals of our our fellow patrons. We we pay we played the first 10-ish hours of this 40-ish hour game. Yeah. I feel like that is enough time to evaluate the, the, the sunk cost rule, the Volpaz law, For like sure. the idea of like, yeah, like this game gets good. It's the, it's the Final Fantasy 13 problem. At hour 25, it really starts to pick up. Like that's a sentence you shouldn't have to say. That's a bad sentence, man. Like, I don't know. You do a lot in 25 hours. Where would we put this on a ranked list, though? Um, I say we start you, at the line of mediocrity. Here's where I Here's where I come in. And I say, even though I think this game is incredibly mid- it's also, by virtue of the kind of games we play, better than most of them. Yeah. But in some ways, less interesting. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm I'm a man of reason. Worth saying, you know, top of our list, we have My Magic 6, The Mandate of Heaven. Congratulations. The bottom of the list, um, you know, probably forever. It's Unlimited Saga uh, from Square. Congratulations, Squaresoft. Uh, good luck in your Fuck off future forever. endeavors. Unlimited Saga. So right at the middle now, we've got Soma Bringer, which is a DS action RPG from Monolith Soft. Those, um, you know, the Xenosaga people. Better or worse than Soma Bringer, I guess. Better. Yeah. I think it's better by like, but it's a ma- it's a game of inches, right? Um, at, at a certain point, yes, but I think I would play this over Soma Bringer. Sure. I feel like it's more functional as a video game. It's more, yeah, like Soma Bringer is an ARPG, right? Like a, On it has DS. its own spin, but kind of the ARPGs are kind of comfort foody, and like that is very specifically operating in like the Diablo space. You know, not to diminish like the work and the bespokeness of it, but they, you can kind of see. Yeah. I think I think that I mean both of these games I think are afflicted with reputations and fan bases that presented them as being bigger than they actually are, but. Um, I was actually disappointed with Summerbringer, like the slippery gameplay and how the characters controlled and how you did damage. I, I was actually kind of disappointed. Yeah, by I think it. the list reflects. Um, so Bahamut Lagoon, um, another uh... game that I played and went. I wish I thought this was going to be better based on how it was pitched to me. I will say this in favor of Bahamut Lagoon. Which is, I think that game has a lot more going for it narratively. Hmm. Um, because this game's story is like, it, it's an afterthought to provide visual it, it is, flair it is, and animation. It is JRPG story, the JRPG. Bahamut Lagoon has characters that it heart-wrenchingly 
tries to convey character arcs that they want you to buy into. And does it have Lavit Slambert? It yeah. doesn't. And that sucks for it, doesn't it? Here's the other, you know, we're getting into, the, we're, we're at a point where this, you can start saying stuff like this with a list this long. Is like, I, I might, I could entertain the idea that Bottom of Lagoon is better than this game, but I think this game is probably better than Hybrid Heaven, on the other hand. Wait, what's above Bahamut Hybrid Lagoon? Heaven. It's better. Is this game better? Do we better need to rerank? No, this no. I'm, it's, again, this is science and things are immutable, right? Um, but I guess what I'm saying, I'm in a generous mood. I finished my beer and um, I'd like to give this at least hybrid heaven, right? Because like, I I know, like, I, I know, I know. Oh, I... <laughs> like, I'm not silly. I know hybrid heaven's not great, but... I don't think this is better than Dragon Quest 1 under any uh, circumstance. Mm. That's a... Jeff, are you letting letting your notions of leg- game legacy... I think that's part of it, but I also think judgment. Dragon Quest 1 is so streamlined and so tight most of the time. Like, the worst parts of Dragon Quest 1 are the parts where it is not streamlined and tight, where you are just, like, hunt and pecking across a map for shit on occasion. Like, that's not great. And there, that's why that game is inexplicably below a franchise basketball game with a bad Spike Lee movie in it. <laughs> okay, I will say this. There's no way that I allow this to go over 2K. Uh, I'll, I'll put it this way. Several months ago, I, I was uh, diagnosed with executive function disorder and given a prescription for Ritalin. Ah. And let me tell you, slow-ass, uh, indul- long-ass RPGs are a lot easier to stomach when you've had legally prescribed stimulants. Hmm. And in in this case, I think Legend of Dragoon, if you take the game as it is and just chill out and I can't believe I'm the fuck one fucking defending this game. Um and do your combo attacks, it is a time. This game is right. fine. Yeah. Like it's yeah, fine. To be clear. It's, like it's a so fine no, out let's of 10. let's restart this. Let's start at uh Soma Bringers is is Legend of Dragoon better than yes. Soma Bringers? Establish better. that. Yes. Okay. What's the next game, Jeff? Bahamut, Bahamut Lagoon. Lagoon. Yeah. Braden, is this better I think than this Bahamut? Game is better Lagoon? than Bahamut Lagoon. Jeff, is this better than Bahamut Lagoon? Yes. I would agree. I think this game is yeah. better than Bahamut Lagoon only because I think the usability and also like the randomness of the yeah. dragon sucks. Yes. Shit. The, the in introduction to the genre aspect of this really helps it. Okay. What's the Hybrid next Heaven. game? I think this is better than <laughs> Hybrid agree. Heaven. I think. Legend of Dragoon is better than Hybrid Heaven. Next Dragon game. Dragon Quest 1. The things we've done on this list, lads, are pretty dark. I would rather play this than Dragon Quest 1 again. Yeah, I think that's the thing. Is like, I would rather play this than Dragon Quest 1. Right. Well, then my... I'd, yeah. rather see... right. I'd, rather, I'd rather see this game to its end than play Dragon Quest 1 a All second right. time. Well, then it goes above Dragon Quest 1. So is it better than NBA 2K16? Absolutely. No. no. Okay. All right. Well, then we're done. Lavit Slamber is no match for team owner. God. It's true. It's no match for your childhood friend ascending to basketball. Heaven. Disappearing from the screen in one frame uh, after. Oh, my God. We're... In, in his white so hoodie, many... his all white. That game sweatsuit. is sweeping the trenches. It is incredible. I like how Gina was, was agreeing to our rules of not to share his input until we got to, is this better than yeah. 2K? And then he just couldn't you keep your mouth himself. shut. Well, yeah. um, God. Keep your mouth shut. Yes. Look, I stayed out of it until I heard a game that I've definitely played. <laughs> uh, and then when I heard a game I played, I could not say it's better than that because I've played both of these games and one of them had. Also, NBA 2K16 uh, seems like a good basketball yeah. sim. Yeah, it's also a fine basketball That game turns game. into kind of Tokimeki. Again, I want to be clear. Like it's a, like, like a lot of sports RPGs do. Like they come from that powerful pro Yaku Konami baseball genre of RPG which is just sports RPG. It's just Tokimeki, but you're a sportsman. I would love if the random battles in this game involve me throwing sick alley-oops, but they yeah. don't. They involve me well, pressing the Well, then X maybe we the right do time. need to replay Charles Barkley Shut Up and Jam <laughs> Guy Down. No. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, so, um, okay. yes, The Legend of Dragoon is number 11 on this list, replacing Dragon Quest One. so that's where it will live, between NBA 2K16 featuring a Spike Lee joint and Dragon Quest One. Uh, congratulations, Shuhei Yoshida. Um, this is probably one of the higher accomplishments of your life. So, congrats. You've, you made the list as a producer, at least. 
Enjoy, enjoy your medal, because we're definitely going to mail you one of those. It's Legend of Dragoon and that video about here's how you <laughs> play used games on that PS4. Was him in that. Yeah. Top top three E three moment of all time. Two ninety nine. Yeah. It, it, it just under the two ninety nine. And I I'm accounting for twenty five years of stuff that might also be better. But Jesus Christ, what a what a thing. What a brutal, brutal thing. Maybe maybe maybe, maybe trolling Sony by Microsoft trolling sony by saying hey we got one last announcement and then they played the literal trailer for final fantasy 13 that sony had shown three yeah, years like prior the same at the end of their conference and just mic drop and it's like yeah we have final fantasy for, fuck off. for different reasons you get your like you know one million troops and you're look you can see the bottom of my shoes and like all of mr caffeine like these are based but... on battles from actual history <laughs> the the number one forever and always has to be 299 yeah no competition like, um like literally killed a fucking console in an entire geographic yeah. area just fucking amazing and if you don't know what we're talking about just uh google the price heard around the world 299 e395 the first one so we've got a draw to do we've got 13 games left on this list yeah, not Gino's we, have, pick. we not added Gino's a new pick. game. Please, in, not the, in the spirit pick. Please of not Gino's pick, please not Gino's pick, please not. You've, Gino's you've got to stop oh, sorry. doing that. Yeah, in, in the spirit of me to threatening us. to fight um, M Paladino, two of these are actually from other hosts still, uh, but the other eleven are from patrons. So I'm going to hit this random number generator. I, I would, I would suggest you rig it and remove my for now. Uh, I'm going to do that. I'm can't. Yeah. We're not you can't do that. change the rules okay, fine. midstream. Fine, fine. Don't rig it. That this is how honest yeah. we are, listeners. Okay, I've drawn a number. Oh, what is it? All right, all right. We're gonna be in a good mood, lads. Check this out. Our next game we're gonna be playing is Goddamn Knox, baby. <laughs> <laughs> we're back to PC RPG time. Whoop whoop. The Command and Conquer people tried to make their own Diablo. Yes. It's Speaking of game. ARPGs, oh, this is... okay. How do you spell N-O-X. this? N-O-X. N-O-X. Yeah. So this is okay, not K. Yeah, so this is a okay. pretty widely available game. We need to figure out network play. There's a fan patch okay. for it yep. that makes it run on Windows 10. I forget if I have this on GOG I'm or like, somewhere else. You probably have it. Yeah, on Yeah, let me go look through my GOG folder. But anyways, there is a way to play network play. This game has multiplayer. Um. Yeah, here we go. We got to get it to work. Yes. Uh, about three weeks from now, look forward to us talking about Knox. That game is probably... It, it is discounted quite regularly because it is... Um, it has a reputation of midness, I suppose. Like I said, we're going to have b- most mid as a uh, <laughs> GOTY That's category. almost cruel, but yeah. Um, yeah, Knox. Check it out. Definitely on GOG. Probably on Steam. It's probably on. Brayden's the one that knows the most about this. So, Brayden, why don't you do like a quick like elevator pitch for Knox? Other than it's the Command and Conquer people. Okay, here here is what I would say about Knox: is in the four years between Diablo and Diablo two, a lot of developers tried to make their own spin on that genre before Diablo two basically calcified the entire thing into what we know today. And Knox is probably one of the weirder ones of those. Worth noting, if you buy Knox, uh, the immediate game that GOG recommends is Anachronox. Anach- Anachronox those is are a different better games. game. They're, uh, it's anyway. also better. But no, also, it yes, it's very different. It's yeah. very different. Um, here's how I'll, I'll, I'll pitch it to you two is, I would say it is almost more like Gauntlet than it is Ooh. like Diablo. Oh, is it like Gauntlet Dart Legacy? Because that's one of my favorite games of all time. I... I also played a lot of Gauntlet Dark Legacy as a child. I doubt it. Have you guys up. played Gauntlet Four for the Genesis? No. Okay, so no. here's the thing about Gauntlet no. Four for the Genesis. It is basically just Gauntlet, like the original arcade release, and that's that's not super interesting 
to me. But there's a quest mode in it that is all new, and it is kind of a weird ARPG thing. And it even gets more interesting from there because the game was developed in-house by M2 as their first game ever, and it has maybe a top five Genesis soundtrack ever. It, it is some of the best music on that platform. It's up there with like Elemental Master and like Thunder Force 3. It's incredible. Are you going to reintroduce people to Genesis music like how Jeff Gersman has been reintroducing multiple people to the Sega Sound Team concert? God, those are so good. So good. Like Cassiopeia adjacent shit. I knew Jeff knew what the Sega Sound Team was. I'm a, I'm a Sega pervert. Sorry. Y'all know this. No, we're sorry. Wait till I inflict Panzer Dragoon Saga on the world, okay? Just wait. You know what? That's not even inflict. That's bless you. Don't worry, Jeff. At some point, we'll play all three parts of Shining Force yeah, 3. Yeah, less that. If you believe. I guess if I would inflict something on you, it would be like Mystaria. But, um, boy, that game. That game's kind of rough. Yeah, but it's the only Mystaria video game adaptation. <laughs> uh, Hollow Earth. Okay. That's the end of this show. So next time it's Nox. Next time it's Nox. Next time it's Nox. Thank you, those listening, for tuning in off the deep end. Thank you, those listening to the podcast as well, for tuning in off the deep end. A Deep Listens podcast, a fun spinoff. Here we are. Uh, once again, if you have questions, comments, concerns, all of that, you can send email to inquiries at deep.lol. That is inquiries at deep.lol. Also, if you'd like to help the show and the Deep Listens enterprise as a whole, consider kicking out a few bucks to Patreon. That is patreon.com slash deep listens. Any dollar amount is appreciated and will get you access to our Deep Listens Discord where you can send complaints and concerns prayers or otherwise to us in real time and again gets you the opportunity to put a game in the rpg slush pile which we'll pull from again at the end of our nox episode presuming we don't decide to just keep playing nox i guess which uh nox is not very yeah i'm gonna go on a limb and say not like uh, special shout out to the artist of super sex 420 for just for the podcast halfway with some other great tracks by super sex 420 up on band Com. Just search for Super Sex 420. That is spelled out sounds. See you next time. And remember, there's no such thing as cheating. Bye. This episode of Off the Deep End was recorded and edited on the traditional and ancestral territory of the Dishkwali Apsh, or Nisqually people, who have lived on and stewarded these lands and waters since times immemorial.